I've been working on creating a falling sand cellular automaton in a compute shader. Very briefly, compute shaders are sets of instructions that run on the GPU in parallel, providing extremely fast execution for the right types of problems. Falling sand cellular automata are a type of simulation that recreate how materials like sand, gravel, water, etc. behave on a discrete grid of cells following specific instructions based on their immediate neighbors. Sand falls down if able. If it is unable, it falls diagonally. If it is unable, it rests. Water falls down, then diagonally, then it tries to flow sideways. Gravel behaves identically to sand, except it has a different angle of repose, causing it to form steeper piles. I'll assume that you're otherwise familiar with cellular automata, falling sand simulations, and the basics of compute shaders. There are some links to excellent resources that help me learn more in the description. I'll start with how the compute shader is set up. There are currently nine separate kernels that each have their own job that are executed one or more times each frame. These executions are orchestrated by a C-sharp script that also handles reading user input. The C-sharp script and the compute shader share data in the form of texture 2Ds, structured buffers, and a few odds and ends variables. The data for all the cell materials is stored in a 2D texture of type int4. I'll refer to this as the cell material texture. Broadly, the compute shader reads this texture, decides what the next simulation frame should look like, then draws that result to a separate 2D texture referred to as the result texture. It's important to have two cell material textures rather than just one, and to split the result into a third texture rather than just drawing the output cell material texture directly. I'll go into more details about this point later, but the gist is that after each frame is processed, the input and output cell material textures are swapped. The old output becomes the input for the next frame, and the old input gets wiped to be used as the next frame's output. Let's look at how a cell material texture is set up. I said before that they are 2D textures of type int4. What that means is that the texture has a number of pixels or cells that each have four integer components. I use each of these components to store information about the type of material in that cell. The X component stores the material type, a unique integer for each different material. Solid stone is one, sand is two, gravel is three, etc. The Y component stores the gravity type. This is not necessarily unique and tells the kernels how the material wants to behave. Does it fall down? Does it fall diagonally? Does it flow? I store this separately from the material type because different materials can have the same gravity types, but different properties in other respects. The Z component stores two values in one integer using a pairing function, the material's angle of repose and its density. Density is used as you might expect when evaluating a swap between two cells to determine which cell moves up and which moves down. Angle of repose is an analog of the actual physical property of granular materials and describes the angle formed by a pile of that material. The W component of the cell material texture is used as miscellaneous extra data, and means different things depending on the cell's material type. Currently, it stores the travel angle and velocity of non-standard physics materials like bullets, and a darkening value for materials that have been affected by explosions. Now back to the nine kernels, they are in order of execution. Reset textures. This wipes the previous frame's input cell material texture to a blank state. This is not as simple as just zeroing out all the values, since in this simulation, empty cells are actually filled with air, a material with specific properties. This kernel also places a one cell thick boundary of solid stone around the entire texture. This is useful for testing and debugging, since I haven't implemented any world generation yet. Mouse input kernel. This works alongside the C-sharp orchestrator to process paintbrush style drawing of materials into the game. When the user clicks, the orchestrator translates the world position of that click into the texture's coordinate system, and based on some variables like brush size and material type, the compute shader overwrites the cell material texture in a given radius. The next three kernels all work similarly and each handle a different form of cell movement. The first strictly handles vertical movement. Each cell evaluates itself and its neighbors above and below based on their gravity types and densities. If a cell is able, it falls downward, swapping itself with its neighbor below. It is crucial that this swap happens symmetrically. If a cell swaps with its neighbor below, that neighbor must also decide to swap with the original cell above. I use the term swap, which implies two simultaneous writes, but it's actually two discrete write operations whose execution order cannot be guaranteed. 
This is a massive gotcha when trying to create a simulation like this in a compute shader, and if you don't get it exactly correct, you will run into race conditions that are nasty to debug. The swaps cannot be simultaneous and must be symmetrical. This gets more important the deeper we go into the movement kernels. Resolve diagonal is where diagonal swaps happen, and it's also where race conditions really start to crop up if you're not very careful. Consider the situation on screen. The two sand pixels highlighted in blue both want to fall diagonally into the empty cell highlighted in green. The empty cell will happily accept either sand pixel. If I run the diagonal kernel from here with no means of avoiding race conditions, both sand cells will write themselves into the empty space and the simulation will lose one cell of sand. How can this be avoided? My solution was to pass an RNG value to the simulation at each frame. This is a float that ranges between 0 and 1 and will be useful for further game mechanics as well. If the RNG is below 0.5, cells only process movement in the left direction. If the RNG is above 0.5, cells only process movement to the right. Recall that this needs to be symmetrical, so this left and right is from the perspective of the current cell being processed, and cells must also look in the opposite direction for other cells that may want to swap into their current position. Diagonal movement also takes into account a material's angle of repose. In my implementation, this angle is actually the probability that a cell will fall diagonally if able. If a cell's angle of repose is above a threshold, it will fall diagonally. I could use the same RNG value for this, but doing so would cause some problems. Given a uniform distribution of random numbers, eventually all materials would form 45 degree angle piles, and the angle of repose would just control the speed that the piles settle. Instead, I use static RNG in the form of a deterministic hashing function that takes two inputs and returns one float output between 0 and 1. I pass a cell's x and y texture coordinates into this hashing function and compare the value to its angle of repose. Since this is a deterministic process, I am able to keep the swap check symmetry and steep piles of cells will stay steep forever. Next is resolve flow. This is where horizontal movement of liquids is handled. All of the requisite pieces are in place to make this kernel pretty simple to implement. It uses the same dynamic RNG as the diagonal kernel to determine movement direction. It doesn't use the static hashing function because, at least for now, all liquids want to settle out to a flat plane. There is still one small issue with the flow, however. Fluids are very slow to settle. There's no concept of water pressure, and cells can really only move one pixel at a time. Large volumes of water take a long time to form a flat plane. Solving this can either be a gigantic can of worms or a simple band-aid, and I opted for the latter. Each frame, I run the horizontal flow kernel multiple times. This dramatically speeds up liquid settling time relative to the rest of the simulation. I actually end up running the vertical and diagonal kernels multiple times per frame as well. Four times each for the vertical and diagonal kernels, and 32 times for horizontal flow. This is the biggest performance trade-off in the entire system so far. Since there's no traditional optimization, like splitting the world into chunks, dirty rectangles, etc., every time I increase the number of simulation steps per frame, there's a big hit to frame rate. I may need to revisit this later, but as it stands, I still achieve outstanding performance on a large canvas. I wanted to have variable fluid viscosity. For some fluids like lava, slow settling times is actually desirable. To achieve this, I added a global timer that is used to selectively allow or disallow fluids from flowing. Fluid viscosity is a material-specific property that is stored in an int ranging from 0 to 100. If a fluid has zero viscosity, it doesn't care about the global timer and will always flow if able. If a fluid has higher viscosity, it only flows if global timer mod viscosity equals zero. This is currently the only use for the global timer, but I suspect that it will come in handy for sprite animations, and particularly idle animations. The character controller kernels are next. First up is movement. The character sprite is 11 by 21 pixels, but most of that is only drawn to the result texture. There's a single pixel at the bottom center of the sprite that is a character material in the cell material texture. The rest is transparent as far as the simulation is concerned. The C-sharp orchestrator reads keyboard inputs and passes them to the compute shader. Depending on the inputs, the character material pixel is moved left or right if the neighboring pixels can accept the player. This kernel also checks a few pixels above and below the movement target to allow the character to walk up and down gentle slopes. To refine this further, I would add collision pixels that define a bounding box around the character's sprite 
so his head doesn't clip into walls or ceilings, and materials interact as expected with his body. All of the character physics is handled in the compute shader as well. Right now it's limited to gravity, but in the future this will be fleshed out to include more complicated interactions. This movement kernel also continually writes the character's position to a read-write structured buffer. Each frame, the contents of this buffer are requested by the C-sharp orchestrator asynchronously. This allows the game camera to lerp towards the character's position so he doesn't get lost outside of the bounds of the screen. The character actions kernel handles non-movement actions. At present, this is only a railgun-style weapon that shoots a projectile where the mouse cursor is pointing. The projectile is an actual cell material that is part of the simulation, as is the trail that it leaves behind. As soon as the projectile shot is registered, the rest of the projectile physics is handled in the other simulation resolution kernels, albeit in a somewhat special manner. The projectile needs to move much faster than the other materials, so I wrote a pixel-based raycast function. It takes a material type and two input vectors, position and velocity, and iterates over all cells in the line from the position along the velocity vector. It returns a collision if any of the cells interact with the input material type. If no collision is found, it returns the most distant cell. For the railgun projectile, if a collision is registered, the projectile explodes. The explosion has a few components. The first either deletes or melts all pixels in a given inner radius. The second darkens some pixels in a larger outer radius. A pixel is darkened if a combined check of its static hash RNG and the dynamic frame RNG is above some threshold. This darkening is stored in the W component of the cell material texture and is a simple integer that increments by some amount every time a cell is darkened. The character draw kernel looks at where the character pixel is located and draws the sprite onto the result texture. This kernel also handles animation, which also takes place on the GPU. I can't just have a separate sprite texture for each animation frame and swap between them based on the character's animation state. There's a maximum number of textures that can be assigned to one compute shader, and as far as I can tell there's no way around this limit. Instead, I see two options. One is a sprite sheet style solution. All of the character's animation frames are loaded into one large texture, and depending on what the character is doing, certain portions of this texture are drawn to the screen. This is pretty standard for 2D games, and is easy to implement in a compute shader. The other option is to manually animate each frame, literally drawing each pixel of a given animation frame one by one, with the code automated by some external solution. It seems like a clumsy way to animate, but I might explore the performance trade-offs of each method. For now, I'm using a sprite sheet. The final step is the draw result kernel. This reads the frame's output material texture and draws pixels in the render texture based on the simulation state. Each material type has a baseline color that is darkened slightly based on the static hash of its coordinates. This gives some visual texture to the world so everything isn't just one flat color. The darkening in each cell's W component is also applied here. Since each cell carries its darkening component as it moves in the world, cell staining is persistent, reversible, and unique to each cell. And that's it for the compute shader itself. Now I'll briefly run through the C-sharp orchestrator script and what it does each frame. Before the simulation starts, all of the kernels and textures are initialized to a blank state. Each frame there is an asynchronous request sent to the GPU for the character's position, which drives the camera movement. Also each frame, user inputs are read, and if applicable, are sent to the GPU. Then a simulation step is performed. As previously mentioned, each simulation step executes many of the kernels. There is an outer loop that first swaps the input and output textures, then resets the output texture, then handles mouse input, vertical and diagonal movement, and then an inner loop is run that handles horizontal flow. After this outer loop is finished, character movement, actions, and animations are executed. Finally, the simulation state is drawn to the render texture. Now I'll discuss some of the things that this simulation doesn't do, at least not yet. It doesn't handle any material-material interactions beyond density or gravity-based swaps. The list of potential interactions is long and includes things like water cooling lava forming stone and releasing smoke, salt dissolving in water, acids corroding certain materials, and much more. I will likely handle most of these interactions in the cell material movement kernels but some might be more appropriately checked in a separate kernel that is executed at the start of a frame before movement is considered. There are no enemies. It's a big gray area that I haven't considered how to tackle yet. Off the top of my head, enemies would have a similar pipeline to the player, with 
some simple pathfinding and some heuristics to determine how they act. There is no character data beyond position and animation state. Things like health, energy, inventory, experience. This should be fairly straightforward to implement with a read-write structured buffer, similar to how the character's position is passed between the CPU and GPU via asynchronous reads. I think a lot of this data doesn't ever need to leave the GPU, but for things like saving and loading data, everything necessary to preserve the game state should be readable at some point by the CPU. There are no sound effects. I don't know of any way to handle audio directly on the GPU. I'm almost certain that this needs to happen on the CPU. And for me, the biggest current missing piece is a large or potentially infinite world. I don't know that there's a silver bullet for this given how rigid the canvas is right now. I suspect that I'll need to add some of the optimizations from CPU falling sand games that I've been avoiding. Things like breaking the world into chunks, or even large chunks, and stitching them together may be the way forward. But that's it for now. Thanks for watching.